Well, we grew up on a farm, number one. In the summertime, we walked to school, which was about two miles. And in the wintertime was a different story. We were driven by my father with a sleigh box and a couple of horses leading. And uh, my father would be all frosted over with his breathing. <laughs> and uh, so when he'd get us to school and we were safe, then he'd go back home and be there again in the afternoon to pick us up when school was finished. My mother was a, <laughs> a city girl, so it was very difficult for her too. And so she had mattresses made for the sleigh box, and we were all dressed winter-like and with quilts all around us so we didn't get cold. Not like that today. Well, it, they, it was a grade school, from uh, grades one to eight. And then they built another room on for a high school, where it went from eight to 12. Was it just, um, would, would it have been two, two teachers between the two rooms, or? Yes, otherwise one teacher taught eight grades. Oh yes, <coughs> the, the newspaper, I'd send in an article every week things that were going on in the community. And that wasn't when I was in the lower grades. It was, well, I, <clears throat> I knew a lot of people. So, and st stories got around and mainly through the telephone. Would it be fair to say it was sort of a, like a gossip column or? I, I would say that now, yeah. The, pa the local paper was called the Tisdale Recorder. It's still going. Yeah, it was just volunteer. Well, he was a, a volunteer too, and uh, he he named the district and and uh, was well known throughout. He was one of the, I guess they called him a trustee or something like that. He uh, came to Canada as a late teenager, and then when Canada went to war, he joined the Canadian Army and went overseas, and where he was wounded almost immediately, as so many were. Um, he was very fortunate. So many were killed, but he was badly wounded and was sent to a hospital in Scotland where he recovered. And uh, his he didn't really talk about the war, but we, he had holes all, like he'd, in those days there was no bathtubs, he used a sponge bath, and um, he had, his back was full of holes, and as children we used to put our fingers in these holes, and, and he would just laugh, but never tell us what it was all about. Yes. The whole back was covered. He uh, fought Vimy. He never talked about that. My mother being from um, England and uh, a city girl, uh, she kept us away from the barns and she was afraid we'd get hurt. And, but the boys were allowed out there. But when the machinery came in later, I really enjoyed that. Get on a tractor and, and you'd back and forth with the cultivator and the plows and the, everything. They didn't have freezers in those days, but in the <clears throat> winter time, they, they put the uh, vegetables and fruits in the basement where they were frozen all winter. Well, there were times when they didn't have enough water to, which came from the rain. He came from a, a large German family. I think there were about 14 in the family. And uh, <clears throat> they were all hardworking Germans. And um, he, he worked on the farm for, for my dad, and also his father. And uh, a very good looking fellow, blonde, bluish yeah, green eyes. eyes. Yeah. And he was called up to go overseas. And he, he went through the France, Belgium, 
Germany, Holland, went through the whole bit. They were still fighting in, in Holland when the war was over and they didn't know it. He was six years older than me. Never thought much about it. Were your grandparents, or your parents talking about it? Well, they were, but we didn't know anything about war. Canada, especially in the prairies, was nothing but land. You didn't see much. And we only had radio in those days. No television. Radio was quite interesting. Uh, <clears throat> there would be people on there that liked to talk. A lot of entertainment, music, especially Western. And there was country dances that we all loved to go to. And my husband was a, a, really a good dancer. Their parents taught them to dance. Dad's um, Russian-German family, the they were all good dancers, and they did that Russian dance where you right. could pick your yeah. legs up. They could all do that. That's pretty impressive. And yeah. then they were quite musical as well, so they played the accordion, and so they really liked to have a good time. And they it was at the school, wasn't it, Mom? Yes. Yeah. That's where they had all the dances, was in the schoolhouse. Well, if you were phoning someone in another province, you try not to talk too long because you were sent a bill. <laughs> but that's the only, uh, you know, way they could communicate, apart from writing letters, and everyone wrote letters. I don't know if you've seen the old phones, they were made of wood, and with a, a dialing system, and you would ring like, if you're phoning someone, um, two twenty-three or something, well, you two rings and then three. Separate the calls. Well, if the line was busy, you had to wait till that line cleared. You'd hear them talking. Yeah. Well, mainly <laughs> going to the top of the hay it was piled in there and then sliding down, that sort of, just childish things. There was no skiing or anything in our family. The way we, we were all dressed in that picture, it was either made by me or I'd go to sales. My mother was trained in England as a milliner. So she knew how to sew? Yes. They made hats. <laughs> We left the farm, of course, the war was well over, and my husband never got a, a pension or anything, nor did my father. He had a sister living in Vancouver, North Vancouver, and husband, and a sister had phoned and said, John, if you can be out here by Friday weekend, I've got a job for you. So we just packed up our, all the children and uh, left the farm never went back, and he was working for the district of, of North Vancouver, building roads. That was in Canyon Heights, right near the Cleveland Dam, and we had a few hundred dollars, which we bought property on, on Canyon Boulevard, I think it was. Well, <clears throat> we had to have a little money to go with, so we sold a cow and used the money for the down payment for the house on Canyon Boulevard. From there we were here. They needed help. And his brother-in-law worked for the municipality as well. So he had access to the, what was needed. So, and there were many people waiting for that job. Jobs were scarce. I'd heard, it, heard about it in the newspapers. They were looking for help. And so I spoke to my father about it and he said, way you go. So I got on a train, went to Ontario and, 
I met a, a, a family there that I stayed with wherever I went, Isabel and Joe Morrison. They had one son, and, and uh, through her, I worked in the shell filling plant at Ajax to begin with, and she moved to where they were making bombs and had me go along, and so. To make the shells, you sat behind glass, and, and it was a long room, and there was young people working all the way, young girl, girls mainly, and you'd be sitting on this stool, and with your pressing the shells, the gunpowder into the shell, and occasionally they would blow up when you were doing it. The shell, the, uh, the plate glass protected you. Then we didn't make a lot of money, but we made money. It was a, a sort of a monotonous day, doing the same thing over and over and over. Steve. Yeah, they were fairly heavy, like we just put the shell in there but then it went into a larger, about that high. And strange thing, these shells that I was making, my husband was firing on the battlefield. Would you have, obviously he you, you wasn't your husband at that time, but would you have made that connection while, while you were making the shells? Did you know sort of what, what John was doing at that time? Uh, well, sort of yes and no. We wrote letters. And the off time went shopping, <laughs> my clothes. <laughs> yeah, the most you made friends with everyone, but it, it didn't last because you're moving around so much. They were mainly people about my age. All the older people were at war. I think I'd left home when I was about 16 or 17, dropped out. Probably about uh, six to nine months. As soon as I was 18, I joined the Army in Toronto. I think it probably had a lot to do with my father and to get off the farm. Just wanted to do something. When you're a teenager, you don't really think that much about helping others. You're trying to help yourself. Agree? Well, the uniform, that was the first thing, being fitted into a uniform, and then you were in. That was important. What about the training? Well, I started out taking office work, doing that, and it was so boring. <laughs> so I got into driving. I forget now how long that course was, it was quite a while. And they taught us how to drive just about everything and sent out to a place that needed a, a driver. Well, you, you were taught everything about driving a car from the tires and putting fuel in and so on, but never really had to do that because those vehicles were in good shape. Part of your training was the marching, so you had to... Oh, yes. Can you talk about that? Well, it was fun to march, and I was, it came in very useful to me. A few years ago, I joined the uh, Lower Mainland Color Party. I was marching in all the parades. About the well, my training in the Army has served me well during my life. It, uh, you never got up without making your bed, never left it unmade, and consequently, some of the children Pick that up too, <laughs> and uh, you never left a mess. No, I I loved it.
Well, I, I loved to get in those vehicles and drove a lot of Jeeps and later on cars and, and meet the, uh, the, I was sent to Halifax after my training. We'd meet the ships coming in, that sort of thing. It was quite interesting. And then bringing the boys back from war from England. It's quite interesting. I taught all my children to drive except the last one, and my nerves had shot by then. <laughs> They'd get so close to hitting another vehicle, and I've just given it up. The Army vehicles were not that great, especially during the war. Pretty heavy, junky. The Jeeps were probably the favorite, and they were all open. You'd be driving along. Uh, well, if, if I was picking, I'd mainly be picking up officers, so I'd take them to uh, a facility that was for the armed forces. Oh, they were just normal people. Well, they just talked about where, where they were going. They were really only interested in, in themselves. Were they happy uh, to be home? Oh, well, the ones that I met in Halifax were, they all were. They're all dead now. <laughs> I had a, a friend uh, from, well, I think she ended up living out near, uh, her name was uh, Torchy. We called her Torchy. She was tall and redhead. And she's the one that sent me to Halifax because she, <laughs> she uh, was playing illegally <laughs> when they, when she drew the ticket for Vancouver, and I got Halifax, and she, I forget how she did that, but that's why I went to Halifax. Uh, during my time in the services, I had a couple of friends, uh, Torchy and her husband, and they were both in the services, and uh, we stayed friends for many years. Another friend that I stayed with while I was working in the war plants in Ontario that uh, unfortunately neither are here any longer. I managed to get a transfer to Vancouver since my mother was not well and I wanted to be there to help her. Except she was in Saskatchewan, but it was closer than Halifax. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't you really make sense. <laughs> <laughs> I applied for it, and fortunately, I was granted, and I was given a test time, and completed that. I think it was just the story I told that I'd grown up on a farm around machinery, and had driven tractors and so on. That helped. Very happy. I, I get to go home on holidays and uh, ridden that train right across Canada a few times. I'd been writing to my husband, who was my boyfriend at that time, uh, on a regular basis. And didn't always get the letters there because of the way it was during the war. And uh, so that was the plan. So we were married. In those days, you didn't live together like they do today. So we were married within months after he got back. And uh, my first child was born not too long after we were married. I think uh, it uh, grew with the letters. Well, 
Well, the wedding was fairly normal. You know, that we'd always, our family had always gone to church, so it was a church wedding. And families were all invited, but didn't all come. Do you remember? No, you wouldn't. You were not the, born. <laughs> the story, but there was complications because neither of mom's parents or dad's parents went to the wedding because dad was from a Catholic family and mom was from an Anglican family. Right. So sparrows and blue jays don't mix. And you refused to sign the paper saying that you were going to raise your children Catholic. So dad had to walk you around the church. To talk me into it. You know, that, that was the request of the Catholic Church, that I become a Catholic. And I, I refused. So the, the priest talked to John and said, you talk her into it and it'll be okay. So <laughs> I did sign it, but I never became a Catholic. For John and I, we were just quite happy just to be married, but the family thought that we should be either a Catholic or a Protestant. And we were married through the Catholic Church, but to this day we're Protestant. Well, John was so happy to have me <laughs> that uh, he would have done, he, he left the church for me. He was, I think, as a father, he was overly strict with the children. And I think that had a lot to do with the war, but his parents were very strict also. But he was a much better grandfather. Loved his grandchildren. Well, why don't you talk about the PTSD part of it? Because he definitely suffered from that after the war. You want to talk about that? The sleepless nights, the screaming in the night, that kind of thing? I don't really recall all that right now. Well, you've told me that over the yes. years. And we know that he, um, it's simple things like he didn't, he was buried alive during the war. The bomb exploded near him, he got, and then his friends dug him out. <clears throat> so he never wanted to put a shirt that he had to pull over his head. He always had to have a button up. Right. So that kind of lasting thing stayed with him. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I'd forgotten all about that. Yeah, so you, you tell that story. And then you did tell me about him suffering for years with uh, headaches and my, terrible migraines and not being able to sleep, all related to um, uh, the war. Mm -hmm. I mean, he really was in the thick of it and saw the horrendous side of war. Yeah. He, I, I may have mentioned this, that he told the story, um, he was going to a hearing, I, so I just went to support him. And then um, it was about him getting hearing aids. I thought he was getting a hearing test. It was, it was a hearing with a panel of people. And um, he said, well, he, he told a story well, I went out, I was working this gun, this Beaufort gun, and the radio was, was located near the, with the gun because they had to try and communicate of where to turn it to what they were going to fire on. And then he says, well, I, my shift in the morning, I went out and the two men working on the gun were dead. I had to just pull them off and get on and do my job. So once Dad told that story at the hearing, they said, okay, thank you, Mr. Shaw, we've heard enough. And then he got his hearing aids. This is from Veterans Affairs. Because he was, that gun um, caused his, like, I think it was like his uh, right side. He was pretty much deaf right from the war on. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. Have you got, do you want some, is there some memory you want to talk about, about Dad? Like what? But do you want to talk about his PTSD? about how he behaved after the war? Well, I guess that had to do with his being over strict with the children. Not just over strict. 
Yeah. It's quite violent. Great. He never ever, he, he came close to it, but he never ever uh, hit me. No. <laughs> Very close. I'm volunteering at the Silk Purse, I guess you knew that. I've been there longer than anyone. I, I'm interested in art. And people. And people. I like people. Well, I think you, to volunteer and get outside yourself, and you can give more that way. In every field, they need volunteers. Do as you're told. <laughs> Get with it. I make friends very easily. I I like people. Mom makes mom talks to everyone. So she's she's open to pe meeting people and she's also a good listener. So she'll ask a question. That's how she approaches people and then they get to talk about themselves and that's what people want. So mom is expert at that. Right. And that's why she makes friends. Did you know that? No. <laughs> <laughs> There's oh, good in everyone. I have a large family and they don't all get along for various reasons. But coming from parents like they did, I guess it's no wonder. We, we talked about this a bit earlier because my oldest sister was probably the most affected by um, this post-war with dad having PTSD and then mom coping with it, a young family. So she's kind of been angry her whole life and we, it's like, why is, she, why is she so angry? We don't know. It's just, but I believe it's this um, aftermath of the war that really affected her. Well, she's very, she's very clever. She can do anything. She started her own business and there's nothing to stop her in anything she desires. Like she was Miss Vancouver for a while. Good looking girl. But somehow or other she wants to take over and be the boss. You want to talk about, you think that she was affected by... Um, by, her, by her dad, of course. Yeah. Talk, talk about that. Well, he was so overly strict with the children and her being the number one. And she refuses to accept that he had anything to do with her. And she's got, she has three children and they're all affected by it too. I guess still being alive and well. I'm very fortunate to still be alive. My mother died at 76 and my father 72. Had a brother die at the age 40, heart trouble. No matter where I go, when they hear I've had eight children, it's, it's big news, everyone knows. Well, I, I, my family belonged to Legion a long time. My father would go every year to the Remembered Stay, and that was his extent. I think the Legion are doing the best they can to. Well, it was kind of a, a fun night out, and Branch 44 is the one that I originally joined. And uh, they make a nice evening of having, quite often they'll have music, they play bingo, and uh, 
make everyone welcome. Where's Oh yes, they always have something to eat. Candace is in charge of TB vets. Some of the ruling and way back when uh, men could join but women couldn't. And it's fortunately that's changed. Uh, well, when they parade, they have someone in authority that's taking this, the salute, like I stood there. Like. <laughs> and uh, it's always been done by men, so I was like the first woman to have done it in West Van. It's an honor. Well, I think that they should think about those that have gone on ahead and not made it. Just want things to be better and help where they can. Those people who gave their lives for yes. our country. Like in thousands upon thousands have. I don't think much of the police and uh, now who just go around shooting people <laughs> don't behave. I'm watching too much television. Well, I, if you got any suggestions. <laughs> I was hoping to cheat off of your answer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, for me, life has been very good. I'm very happy with my family and uh, just want the best for them. Help is needed, get in there and do it.